Anyway, good morning. So welcome to our campuses. We're grateful for each of you and for those watching our online campus today. Uh, as I wrap up this series, the, the series is really kind of one of those ongoing series. Um, on February the 7th, I'll start a new series, right, called Epicenter. And we'll explain that when we get to that. And it, it'll be along the same lines in some ways, right? Because at the end of the day, the as-you-go model or concept is at the heart of what it means to follow Christ. Jesus is getting ready to go back into heaven. He's ascending into heaven. And he's talking to his disciples one last time. He's talking about the, you know, we receive power in the Holy Spirit and all this kind of stuff. And in the Matthew chapter 18, or chapter 28, verse 18 through 20 version says that all authority has been given to me. All power has been given to me. Therefore, you go make disciples, baptizing, preaching, teaching. It's like it's, the word go, you go, is as you go. That's what it means. It doesn't mean like you're not doing that already. Go ahead and do something separate. It's not even what it means. It means as you're going, since you're going anyway. So we have to translate our thinking as it means of following Christ to just an every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As you do what you're doing, as you go where you're going, as you interact with who you interact with, this is what it's supposed to look like. If you call yourself a follower of Christ. This message uh, may turn into a series eventually. What we're talking about today is the, in every one of these messages, if you missed them, you can find them online, has been the value of something. This one is the value of learning how to abide in Christ. Abide's not a word we use. Uh, it's a, m- most of us probably never have said that word before. Abide. What? Um, and so I'll try to explain that from a biblical perspective this morning. But this is really the crux of the issue. This is, this is what is required if you really want to be a follower of Christ. You've got to be able to do what we're going to talk about today. Let me pick up in chapter 14. I'm going to read a lot of scripture probably today. But chapter 14, I'll pick up in verse 6. Um, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you will really know me, you will know my father as well. Now, one of of the points I'll bring out here in a second is about how the gospel is always in opposition with the culture. Jesus is saying there's only one way to heaven. So in our own culture, people will say, well, yeah, but what about just being good people? I don't get you to heaven. Well, what all those, the Muslims who believe something different, did they get you to heaven? Well, what about people who are Buddhist or people who are Hindu or people who are, I'm not Jesus, right? I'm not the one who died on the cross and I'm not the one who raised from the dead. I'm not the one who's making a crazy claim. But the dude who did do those things said, there's one way you get to heaven. It's not of works. It's by my grace. And it's only through me. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. That'll make sense more why I'm emphasizing that here in a second. He goes on, let's just pick up in uh, verse 11, chapter 14, verse 11. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, and at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. In other words, the things you've seen that's happened in my life that are miraculous, believe on those then. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes, like just think, hear what I'm saying, pay attention to this. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these. Because I am going to be with the Father. Did you hear that? Jesus, this is Jesus talking, right? Um, anyone who believes in me, so if I had you raise your hands, how many people believe in Jesus? Yeah, believe Jesus okay. Whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. And they'll even do greater things than these. Because I'm going to be with the Father. And he's, he's talking about the Holy Spirit coming in and dwelling in people. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask anything in my name. And I will do it. And I've heard people take that and turn it into how we pray. And if you ask anything in Jesus' name. And, and so the whole, the whole turns into when you end your prayer, I would like a popsicle in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Okay, adding the phrase in Jesus' name does not make it in Jesus' name. That's not what that's talking about. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Right? It's like if you, if you don't say in Jesus' name, that means like it doesn't work anymore. What, that's, not, that's not how prayer is. But that's how some of us were kind of taught for prayer was. That's kind of the way it's been mine. It's like you just say it's in Jesus' name and that's, that works. No, that's not how it works. I'll explain that again. Maybe I'll get to it. We hope so. Right? All right. Now jump with me to chapter 15, all the way over to chapter 15. Verse 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember that I told you a servant's not greater than his master? If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obey my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. They do that because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. In other words, he exposed sin, and therefore now they know that it's sin. Uh, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates the Father as well. If I had not done uh, <clears throat> among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my Father. And all he's saying is, is that, okay, before they didn't understand. They didn't know. But I have demonstrated who I am in front of them, and they still chose to hate me. That's what he's saying. Uh, verse 25, um, but it is also fulfilled to fulfill what is written, they hated me without reason. Verse 26, when the advocate comes, the one I will send from the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you must also testify for what you have been with me from the beginning. All right, we'll stay in chapter 15 a lot today. Um, let me give you the first three points, and then I'll get back to Scripture a little bit. And point number one is actually point number four, I think it was, from last week. Um, the last point I didn't get to. Point number one is flowing with the Holy Spirit requires intentionality. Flowing with the Holy Spirit requires intentionality. <clears throat> now, uh, I got several verses there, and I preached on these last week. I kind of covered most of these verses last week. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus in John chapter 7, don't no reason to turn to it. In John chapter 7 Verse 37 and following, he, he's, he's at this great festival and he has this big feast, and, or there's this big feast, and he says toward the end of the feast, anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. And he, then he goes in this thing and says, because that sounds like, you know, hey, if you're out of what you're drinking, come, I'll give you some more. But then he says, and you'll never thirst again. Because living, rivers of living water will flow from within you. And then the next verse, because like in parentheses, is like, and by this he met the Holy Spirit who had not yet come. Just to make clear whatever he's talking about. He's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit flows from the throne of God. It's sent by God, okay, that at the time it lived on the outside of people, right? The Holy Spirit's always been here from Genesis chapter 1 on. It's always been here, right? The Bible's full of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. The moment you receive Christ your Savior, how you do that is you place your faith, you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ his Lord, raised from the dead, confess with your mouth that he is Lord, and that the Bible says you're saved, right? When you, it's God's grace to us and our faith, not believing in our head, believing in our heart, in him. That's salvation, okay? The moment that happens, the only way salvation happens is when the Holy Spirit indwells. You can't be saved without the work of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the way it works. You can't, there's no other options. That's it, okay? Now, <clears throat> Holy Spirit lives inside of you. The problem is, is that the, how Jesus described how it's supposed to be is this river of living water. This, that we're this conduit of God doing things in us and then God doing things through us. Why? Really, from Jesus' perspective, we do it for Jesus so that he brings glory to the Father. That's the, kind of the biblical path that is described. All right. Um, one of the verses I would have used last week would have been in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse uh, 6, where he's talking about 
where Paul said to Timothy, fan into flame the gift that is within you. You're talking about this motivational gift, right? The, the one, the charisma time gift you have one of. The, it, it's intentionality. It's fan into flame. In other words, it's there. Be intentional about developing your gift, in other words. And, and so it, that's where this concept of learning to flow with the Spirit requires some intentionality. That, that you and I have to be willing to intentionally engage or it just doesn't happen by accident. You just don't learn to operate in your motivational gift by accident. You just don't learn to overcome the downside. I mean, it's natural and easy to operate in the negative side of your motivational gift because it's just kind of who you are. But it's difficult and it requires intentionality to operate in the supernatural side of your spiritual gift because that's the Holy Spirit working in and through you. That's Paul saying, fan in the flame, the gift is within you. Be intentional about developing it. Don't just take the test and blow it off. Don't just say, okay, well, whatever, and move on. See, the problem isn't that the gospel has lost its effectiveness. The, the problem is that people who God has entrusted the gospel to, the message of reconciliation, that God's not holding a sin against mankind, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But many times we've just, uh, are unintentional. Everything, I, there might be something you can argue about this with me, but not much. Everything that happens unintentionally is bad for you. Everything good for you requires intentionality. That's a fair statement, right? Weeds grow unintentionally. Don't require watering. They don't even require dirt. Concrete. Have you ever seen weeds grow out of concrete? I have, right? How's that happen? I don't know. But I got this plant over here that I can't get to grow, right? <laughs> right? Getting in debt, unintentional. Getting out of debt requires intentionality. Name the topic, okay? The positive thing requires intentionality. The negative thing requires no intentionality. It just happens by nature. That's the way it drifts. Healthy things require intentionality. Unhealthy things just happen. Whatever we're talking about, that's the way it works. Well, the same thing is true here. And we talked about last week about grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. You know that, you know, the Holy Spirit, you're saved. You're not, not, you're not saved. It's just the Holy Spirit and you grieve and quench and you all kind of stuff. Here's the thing I need you to understand. Um, we will always thirst. We will never be satisfied until Jesus is our first thirst. I'll say to you again. We chase all these things. We want more. We, we, you know, whatever it is, we're trying to obtain, we're trying to get, we're trying to whatever. We're not satisfied. If I get this, I'll be better off. If this happens, I'll be better off. Whatever it is, we will never be satisfied until Jesus is our first thirst. That's really the principle that underlines the concept I'll talk about today in the concept of, of abiding in Christ. Number two in the outline. The culture will always be in opposition to the gospel. The culture will always be in opposition to the gospel. Um, I'll talk about this because some of the next series. Um, like in 1 Corinthians, no need to turn to it. I'm just going to quote it real fast. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, following, um, Paul say it, would say it this way. The gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. But it's the power of God for salvation for those who believe. What, what, and he goes on and explains it really clear. It's, it, it's like, well, they don't get it because they they've never experienced it. It makes no sense to them. It's just like, whatever, okay? I mean, there's some of you that if I pulled out a, a board today and started drawing football plays up, you think it'd be the best service ever, right? And some of us are like, what's he doing? Why does that even matter? And who, who's, what's that X representing? Who's that O? I don't know what that even means. Well, it's foolishness to the person who don't get it, but to those of us who, who understand what I'm drawing, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I get that. Ooh, ooh that's a good one. That's how we think, right? The gospel is the same way. It's like the, those of us who understand the gospel, who've received Christ, the Spirit of God indwells us, and he kind of interpretates the gospel in our lives. It makes perfect sense to us. It's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. But the person who doesn't believe, 
It's just pure foolish, foolishness. And there are many people who call themselves Christians who don't believe. Believing in your head is not the same as believing in your heart. Many people believe in their head, and they will spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. Believing in your head and believing in your heart are not the same. People who say they believe in Christ, but yet they can't accept principles of Scripture. What's the real issue there? Now, I'm not trying to say somebody loses their salvation. That's not true. But somebody says they believe in Christ, they know they're saved, okay, but they're controlled by their flesh all the time. They're grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. That river of living water has been dammed up and it, is, it doesn't flow. There's no washing and cleansing from unrighteousness taking place. There's no sandpaper and off rough edges taking place. It's just a person living by their flesh like anyone else living by their flesh. Right? The culture is never going to be friendly to the gospel. No one wants to hear Matt, uh, Jesus talking in Matthew or in John chapter 14, verse 6. No one wants to hear Jesus say, There's, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one gets the Father except through me. No one wants to hear that. It's offensive. So you're saying I'm bad people? No, I'm not. I'm saying without Jesus, all of us are sinners in need of a Savior, and we'll spend eternity separated from him if we don't choose him. Now that's real. Number two in the outline. I mean number three in the outline. The culture will always be in opposition to the supernatural faith, or to supernatural faith. The culture will always be in opposition to supernatural faith. In two ways. One in just people's disbelief. God can't do that, blah, 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 blah. That doesn't work that way anymore, you know, whatever, okay? But also in our own individual lives. It's easier to walk by sight than it is to walk by faith. Well, the culture we see, it's like it seems like it's overwhelming. It's like, well, that can never get better. It's so dark out there. We should be afraid. It's so ugly out there. We should be afraid, all that kind of stuff, right? But what we forget is, is that if, if you know Christ, if you don't know Christ, this is not true for you. But if you know Christ, right? Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you believe in your heart, all that kind of stuff, then you're part of a kingdom that supersedes, that transcends, that is above and beyond the culture that we live in. If, I, if, if this room is completely dark, right? I talk about light and dark an awful lot, right? If this room is completely dark, and I light a match, one little bitty match. Do you think that match is intimidated by all the darkness around us? Now, we know that match doesn't really bring light into the room. Right? I mean, just because I light a match don't mean I can even read my own Bible, let alone you guys could read. But that match is not intimidated by the darkness because that match recognizes if, as if a match has a brain. But you know what I'm saying, right? The match recognizes that when it lights, when, you, when light comes in, darkness has to flee. You can't have lightness and darkness in the same place. It just doesn't happen. So the moment you light the match, because it understands the kingdom of light is greater than the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom we're from, the kingdom that we're a part of, is it overrides, it supersedes, it, it transcends the turmoil of the culture that we live in. But yet we seem to find ourselves caught up in the turmoil of the culture. Why would that be happening? Because we buy into the lie that somehow we're a part of that. If you know Christ, you're just a visitor here. Your, your citizenship, your residency, your, your kingdom is in heaven. You're a child of the living God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The thing that lives in you raised Christ and the dead, all those things I talk about. And the kingdom that you're a part of is greater, overrides, supersedes, transcends all the turmoil that's around us in the culture. 
In other words, we can have peace in the middle of the darkness. We can have peace in the middle of the unkindness. We can have peace in the middle of the turmoil. Or we can choose to just reflect the turmoil. To reflect the ugliness and unkindness. You can speak the truth in love. You don't have to be ugly to tell the truth. Right? It it doesn't have to be ugly to stay in your ground or whatever. But the whole idea is, is that we shouldn't be getting caught up in the things of fear and the things of whatever it is that we see around us. Because what we see around us, the culture, it's always going to be in opposition to the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So call time out. Okay, now, the people, I've been preaching on this the last few weeks, right? The work of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you know Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells you. There's gifts that come with that, right? There's your motivational gift. Everybody's got one of those. And then there's the ministry gift and manifestation gifts. The Holy Spirit owns. He has them. He gives as he chooses, as he determines according to Scripture, right? And then there's the fruit of the Spirit, which is different than all that because everyone who knows Christ has the Holy Spirit indwelling them. It's not the fruit of you. It's the fruit of the Spirit in you. So love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering, self-control, those words, right, those words are the result of the Holy Spirit living in you, not the result of you being a better person. So that all of us who know Christ should have these kind of attributes taking place. That's just what it should be like. It's, that should be normal. That the supernatural activity of God should no, most of the time will feel normal and look normal in the life of a believer. In other words, if you have peace in the middle of turmoil, that's supernatural because it's not about you. It's about the Holy Spirit in you, but it doesn't look weird and doesn't look supernatural. It just looks normal because that's just, and people think, well, man, they just, they're, just, they're just cool and easy, right? Nope, got the Holy Spirit in me. That's why I have peace. Well, they, they're just naive. They, just don't, they don't, just don't see what's going on around. Yeah, I see what's going on around me. I've got, I'm not naive, but I just got peace. The Christian that runs around in a tizzy and can't sleep at night because they're all worked up. What is that? That's the rejection of peace. Now, that's you. I'm not talking. I'm not trying to point at you, right? But I know how it goes. Well, no, that's just because I'm upset because this is going on. I'm not debating what's going on. I'm not debating the turmoil. That's not what I'm talking about. The turmoil is bad. Whatever's going on in your personal life, it's, I got you. It's horrible. But the Spirit of God who indwells you is supernatural, and he wants to give you something supernatural. Whatever the thing is you need in the moment, he will give you what you need in the moment. That's who he is. The problem is that most of us as believers don't expect that. We don't have an anticipation of that. God wants us to expect it. Whatever it is that's coming in the moment, God's already there. Whatever's going to happen tomorrow, next month, next year, God's already there. He's already got a plan, and he wants to give us a supernatural whatever it is we need to walk through that. So whether that's things like peace, joy, patience, right? Whether it's the faith to be faithful. Whether it's things that are supernatural, like words of knowledge and words of wisdom. Whether it's miraculous powers that need to happen because of what he wants to demonstrate. Those things don't happen until we learn to abide in Christ. So let me give you number four as a point. And then we'll jump in the passage of Scripture. All that was just the introduction. Point number four. Choosing to abide in Christ is the key to the, un- uh, the unlimited supernatural resources of God. Choosing to abide in Christ is the key to the unlimited supernatural resources of God. So in chapter 14... Well, I read it already. Jesus is saying, I'm the only way to heaven. And know the way you're going. That may offend some people, but that's just the way it's going to be. That's Jesus. Okay. And then in chapter 14, he continues with, if you believe in me, then you do all the things I've done, even greater things than this, you'll be done because the Holy Spirit's going to come, right? And then in chapter, 15, chapter 14, verse 15 and following, he talks about the Holy Spirit. If you love me, you obey me, the Holy Spirit's coming, all kind of stuff, right? Now we get down to verse, um, get down to verse uh, chapter 15, verse 1. It's the same conversation. It just feels a little different because he's talking about fruit and vines and things like that. But it's the same. He's given an illustration. Like he said something. 
He's explained something to them, and now he's given an illustration that they will understand, because all of them will understand this whole grapevine con- concept. Okay? Chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. The phrase true vine means original source. Okay? Like I'm, I'm not growing out of something. Something's growing out of me. I am the true vine. I'm the original source. Uh, my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch from me that bears no fruit. Now, let me just pause for a second because we don't get confused. Okay, <clears throat> this is an illustration. This is not necessarily the place to get your theology from. He's going to say this again in a second. And it's like, okay, and I've heard people say it this way. If you don't, provide, if you don't produce fruit, God cuts you off and throws you into the fire. Hell. That's not what that says. This is an illustration. Okay? Everybody understands the illustration. What he's saying is this. There's one true vine. His name is Jesus. Every one of you are growing out of me. Because he's talking to his disciples here, right? He, in this case, he's talking to us. Those of us who know Christ, we're disciples, right? And so he's saying, you're growing out of me. Uh, anyone who gets saved in six months from now becomes a part of that vine. They are growing out of Christ. I'll explain that more in a minute. And then he says, but the ones that aren't producing fruit, th- those limbs on the bush that have died, we've all seen that happen, right? Then you prune them, you cut them off because they're, they're, they're useless. They're, they're nothing. And he says you throw them in the fire. What he means is you just get rid of them. You, you trash them because the, you can't do anything with those. You can't even like turn them into a table or something. There's nothing you can do with that. It's just dead. Okay? So this is not talking about losing your salvation. This is an illustration of how God perceives people who claim to know him as their Savior and yet produce no fruit. What he's trying to do is raise the value of what it should be like to be a follower of Christ. Now, the enemy wants to stir up stuff in you. Words of condemnation, whatever. That's not ever God. I need you to hear what I say, not what the enemy whispers to you. Well, I don't produce fruit. Therefore, as God cut me off, God must hate me. That's just dumb. That don't come from God. Okay, everything God says to you, the word conviction, it'll be about hope. There's always a solution. There's always, here's what you need to do about this. It's always about restoration, things like that. But here's the idea. Jesus is just saying that you claim to know Christ. Okay, then you should produce fruit. That's throughout Scripture. If you don't produce fruit, well, in in the gardener world, in the the grapevine world, you just cut that off and you throw it in the trash because it's worthless. Okay. In the Christ-following world, it means one of two things. It means either you don't know Christ, which really means you aren't really, to use the illustration, you can't be attached to the vine if you don't know Christ, right? But it either means you don't know Christ or you're grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. Going back to last week's message, that you're one of those two things, that you've grieved him or, or, or you know, hurt him, he's withdrawn, he's pulled back, or you're quenching, you're stopping what he's trying to do in you. So why is it you're not producing fruit? Is it because you're not saved, and the Holy Spirit's not indwelling you, or the Holy Spirit is indwelling you, it's just you grieve and quench him when he tries to do things through you. Because the concept is you will lose, you will produce fruit. That's the idea, right? So... Um, verse 2 again. So he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, corrects, shapes, what, cut back, whatever, so that it will be even more fruitful. We're in, this on, we're in this ongoing process of development. Verse 3. You are already clean, because of the word I have spoke to you. Now, what he's saying to his disciples in that moment is, the word clean and the word prune are exactly the same. In other words, you've already clean, the, the gardener had already pruned that particular vine, that particular section. It's already clean, right? It's pruned. Okay. Verse 4. Remain in me, and I will remain, 
in you. That's, that's talking about the, the vital connection between a branch and the vine. That if you don't remain in me, that branch that doesn't remain in me will die. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. The, the vine is the source. Jesus is the source. The Holy Spirit is the source. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's like he, he's like restating stating it again in a different way. It's like reciprocal re abiding. The word abiding is, is uh, sometimes in this, um, in this translation, it uses the word remain in me. Okay. Um, if I say, hey, can I come to your house and hang out for a few minutes? That's not the word abide. If I say I want to abide with you, that's like I want to hang out for a long time, like months, you know, like a long time, right? Uh, the word abide is like, it, it's, uh, the biblical word here is uh, continual, unbroken fellowship. That's the word. Not your relationship, fellowship. Continual, unbroken fellowship. That there's a connectedness that's taking place. There's communication that's taking place. There's a, there's a flow. If you just think about vines and branches, right? There's a flow from the, from the vine or from the branch itself, or excuse me, the vine itself into the branch. There's a flow. It's a continual flow. And that if anything cuts that flow off or handicaps that flow, then it's going to handicap that branch. Okay, that's, that's the word abide, that we in Christ are to abide in Christ. We, we are to have a, an ongoing, continual fellowship with him, that he is the source of life, that he is the source of our hope. He is the source of our peace. He is the source of our joy. He is the source of our name, the thing. He is the source, that we're going to him for all the topics, that whatever it is we need, he has it, and we're going to him. Now, how does he do that? Through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did not die for your sins. He did not hang on a cross. He did not raise from the dead. Jesus did that. But Jesus is the one who is Lord because that's how God sets it up. Right? Jesus died on a cross. Jesus raised from the dead. Jesus is Lord. Jesus goes, goes and lives back in heaven. The Holy Spirit indwells us. Jesus does not live in your heart. Sometimes you use that terminology to children, you know, or you know, how you invite Jesus in your heart. It's not Jesus, it's not like a little Jesus lives inside you. That's not how it works. It's the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Okay? The Holy Spirit does the work of salvation. Jesus is at one place at one time. Holy Spirit's at all places at all times. Now, so if you just get head, your head around this, this illustration that Jesus is using, He is the vine. Okay, I got that. I or you are individual branches from that vine. He's saying there's like an evaluation process happening here. Where God, the gardener, comes through and he's looking at the vine. And all of his branches. And some of the branches are producing fruit... And, but they need to be trimmed back a little bit. That's what pruning is, right? Trims back a little bit to help it grow more, to help it be more fruitful. Um, it, you can cut things back incorrectly. My, my dad used to raise like uh, roses all the time. And he, he had a very specific way of cutting back his roses because if you come back incorrectly, then they don't, they don't produce more buds. And if you talk to Mike Ruffner, he has a very specific way of cutting back trees because if you cut them back incorrectly, they don't, they don't grow back the same way. There's a correct way to prune. And what this is saying is God knows you. He looks at your life and he's saying, okay, I need to, this is some dead weight happening. This is some stuff that stands in the way of them producing fruit. I'm going to cut this stuff back. That may be, look like, in our world, maybe look like some kind of commitment. Maybe look like something we need to stop doing or start doing. It, it maybe looks like some kind of internal thing God needs to work on us and heal in us. It may be an attitude that we have that God needs to deal with. It may be a relationship that's broken, whatever. It could be a lot of things. But the God trims us back. He prunes us back to make us more fruitful. Okay. And then it says he's looking for branches that aren't fruitful at all. They're not producing fruit.
So a branch is not producing fruit is cut off. It's just thrown away. There's no value to it. There's no point to it. There's, it's worthless. It's just, we don't even want to save it for later because there's nothing to save it later for. You just throw it away, burn it. That's what you do to it. Now, it's not me. This is Jesus doing the talking here. But this is how he sees us. He's telling us how God sees us. Like, God knows who I am. I'm the vine. I am the source. I am the true vine. I am the original source. I am it. If you know me, you're attached to me. You're in me. You're a branch from me. If you produce fruit, for everybody who produces fruit, God's going to prune you. He's going to cut you back because that's the process of producing more fruit. He's going to work in you to wring out unrighteousness and sample off rough edges. That's what God is going to do. But if you're not producing fruit, if there's no evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, then what do you do with that? He cuts it off. Now again, he's not talking about heaven and hell in that moment. People use that to say that. That's not what he's really talking about. It's an illustration about how we handle branches. It is also an illustration about how God sees us. These produce fruit, these don't. Why don't they? Not saved or grieve and quench the Holy Spirit. Those are the only options you got. Okay. Um, I'm not sure where I left off. So I'm going to pick back up in verse 5. I am the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I'm bringing you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not uh, remain in me, you're like a branch is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. Verse 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Okay, now go back to, uh, back to chapter 14. When he says in chapter 14, verse 12, uh, Truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they'll even do greater works than these, because I'm going to be with the Father. If I, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so the Father can be glorified by the Son. You may ask anything in my name, and I will do it. All right, that's attached to chapter 15 over here. All right? So uh, if my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish. It will be done for you. Verse 8, this is for my Father's glory that, I, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. I mean, the way we define what a disciple is is by fruit bearing. That's how Jesus describes this. All right. Um, let me give you, so I've kind of explained what that is. Let me just kind of give you the three basic ways that you abide in Christ, that you remain connected to him, okay? Uh, reading your Bible. Reading your Bible. If you're not reading your Bible, you're handicapping the flow from the vine to the branch, okay? You got to be in God's Word. I don't mean like reading your Bible for, like it's a novel and you just want to read it for, you know, see how many pages I read today. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about engaging God in Scripture, I'd rather you read one verse and engage God and God stir something in you than read 17 chapters and get nothing out of it. Sometimes you want to read a lot because you want to understand a history story or whatever, but the idea is that God speaks through his word. God speaks through two kinds of pieces. There's, there's the Logos and there's the Rhema. The Rhema comes from the Holy Spirit. The Logos, okay, is just God's word. So God's written word on a piece of paper, is, God speaks through that. That's, that's his main way. He never violates the Bible. God never, ever, 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 ever violates the Bible. But when you're looking at that and you read a passage of Scripture, and all of a sudden God makes it blow up in you, it comes alive in you, that's called rain. That's when the Holy Spirit takes something it, that, that's in Scripture, it makes it come alive in you, or if he speaks to you separately from that. But God never violates Scripture. You cannot, you, if, your, your, your spiritual development will always be handicapped if you don't read your Bible. Just the way it is. Number two is prayer. Prayer is communication with God. Don't picture it as praying for a meal, praying for I go to bed, praying when I wake up in the morning. Those things are fine too. It's just this ongoing communication with God. When it says pray without ceasing, okay, or use this concept of abiding, abiding is an unbroken uh, fellowship, right? It's this ongoing conversation. Prayer never really ends. It's a religious word for lack of a better term that just means I'm talking to God. So any version of talking to God, how do you talk to God? Well, 
uh, uh, if I, if I, I can use words, right? I can also use thoughts. God knows all these things, right? There are, you know, moans and groans. God knows all that stuff. I mean, I could look at you and not use my, my not use words and communicate with you. Well, God understands all that. The idea is, is that it's not close your eyes and bow your head all the time. Pray without ceasing means that you're in this constant fellowship. You're in this constant, ongoing conversation with God. Sometimes it's nobody's talking. Just like if you and I were hanging out, we don't have to talk the whole time to enjoy being together and to have relationship happening. There's connectedness happening. And, and then we see things and we, somebody comments and we have a conversation about that. I'm going through life and I see something. And I, I engage God about that. I'm walking through something that's frustrating. God, I need you to help me see this the way you see this because right now I want to kill people. Right? It's like, God, right now I'm overwhelmed by this. God, I need you to help me see this the way you see this because I, I, I feel so defeated. I, see, I feel so discouraged. I feel so overwhelmed. God, I, I've, I've, I've completely lost hope. Or, God, I... I don't know what to do about this. God, can you, or just, maybe it's just God. Do yeah, you ever just look at your kids and you just want to say, I love you? Right? You just want to reach out and for no reason, if you don't speak, you just want to hug them for some reason. You know, like, especially when they get to the age where they pull away from you sometimes. Right? And when they pull away from you, the grunt's even worse, like, Ugh. Right? But when you're the parent, it's like, they, the, the kids don't understand how that hurts us as parents. But as parents, it does. It hurts a little bit. We understand it's part of growing up. We, we're happy they're becoming adults and they're growing up. We, we're happy about that. But man, how many of you miss those snuggle days? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Well, who do you think God wants us to be? The kid who ain't got time for us? Or the kid who wants to crawl up in our laps and snuggle. You know, when God uses phrases in Scripture like, run into my throne room with boldness, that he wants us to recognize we have direct access to him through the Holy Spirit 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He wants us to, without hesitation, to run toward him. To know that we'll be received. To jump up in his lap. That phrase, it says, the phrase is like, the phrase that was used in that, that passage, Abba, Abba, but it really means daddy. That's, that's the Hebrew word for daddy. <laughs> Call me daddy. See, abiding in Christ is, is not about just reading your Bible like it's a history book or reading your Bible because it's some chore that you do. It's about reading your Bible as a way of communicating with him and him communicating with you. Prayer is then having that conversation, has discussing that, talking about what's going on through your day. When you're happy, when you're not happy, when you're frustrated, when you're not frustrated, when you're at peace, when you're not at peace. Sometimes it's just saying thank you. Like when you recognize you're in the middle of something and you feeling you know, the Holy Spirit's protecting you or giving you peace or whatever it is, say thank you. Like, and sometimes it's after the fact and you're just kind of processing what happened that week or that month or that day and you just remember, okay, God's been faithful. God's provided this whole time. Sometimes it's God's asking you to make some kind of step of obedience that to you is bone jarring, that's overwhelming, that's crazy. Okay? But... It's, to him, it's just an ongoing conversation. Like, God, I, I struggle with this. God, God, help me have the faith to step into this. And then you step into it, and it's like, okay, God, help me, help me, help me have the faith to keep standing here, to keep walking in this. It's like the guy in the, the uh, Gospels who said his kid, you know, Jesus said, you don't have faith or whatever. He goes, I have faith. Help my unbelief. I mean, all of us can be that way. It's like, I, I do believe you. I have faith in you, but <laughs> there's this unbelief too. What I see overwhelms me. What I see, that looks like it's impossible, that this can't happen. God, I, I need you. It's just this ongoing conversation. 
It, so there's three things, the, the Bible, prayer, and the, fourth, uh, the third one is the Holy Spirit. You have to recognize that the Holy Spirit is God's resource to you, to us, to me, for his supernatural provision and protection. That's the only way God does it. You can memorize the Bible, know every verse of the Bible, absent the Holy Spirit, all you are is an educated Pharisee. That's it, at the best. It's the Holy Spirit that takes it and makes it alive in you. You're not going to be light in the darkness without the Holy Spirit. You're, you're not going to walk in peace without the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be able to stand in the middle of the culture that is filled with turmoil and whatever else that's in opposition to the gospel, etc., without the work of the Holy Spirit. That you won't see people around you coming to Christ without the work of the Holy Spirit. The, it, the Holy Spirit, you have to recognize who he is. It's like you can have a brand new car, they give it to you full of gas. But you have to recognize that I have to keep going to the gas station and getting gas because if I don't, this brand new car is going to be a piece of junk soon. It's just going to sit there and it's going to do nothing. And you run out of gas, you're calling and saying, hey, this car broke down. I don't know what's wrong with it. It's because you're not getting the fuel it needs, right? The resource to make that fancy car run is called gas. The resource that, 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 God wants, that God has given the person who's a believer in him is the Holy Spirit to teach us all that God said, that Jesus taught, to do the work of God in us and through us, to, to keep wringing us out of the unrighteousness in our life and sandpapering off the rough edges so we become more like Jesus. It's this ongoing process of him producing his fruit in us as we choose to die to our flesh so he can live in us. We can say, as you go, since you're going, be good reflections of Jesus. You can't do that without the Holy Spirit. As you go, since you're going, be light in the darkness. You can't do that without the Holy Spirit. Just name the topic. So many things in life would be different if we stopped fighting with each other and started talking to God. That whatever it is you're going through, the person that you should have the most words with on any given day is with God. It may not be spoken words, but it's communication nevertheless. All day, every day. Abiding in him. And when you get side, you know, blindsided by whatever happened that day, <coughs> abiding in him. And when you feel depleted and exhausted, abiding in him. When you feel like you just can't get up and keep going, when you've lost hope, when you're frustrated about what's going around you, it's not just church stuff. It's not just religious, spiritual topic stuff. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in your homes, in your business, in your school. Whatever it is you do, if you know Christ your Savior, if you've believed in your heart and placed your faith in him, then you're a part of the true branch or the true vine. He is the only source that you have. Maybe what we need to do today in some cases is repent from looking to looking for looking for other sources. I, I need this to be my source. I, I, I need to find this. If I had more of this, if I, could, if I could obtain this, if I could get in this position, if I could fix this, if I could change this. It's kind of how I started. That until Jesus is our first thirst, we'll never really be satisfied. Branch thirst for nutrients, for resources from the vine. That's how we're supposed to be with Jesus. Culture's not going to change. The world's not going to change. Life's going to keep coming full speed. But the good news is God doesn't change. 
And the gospel doesn't change. God's love for you and his plan for you doesn't change. His resource for the Holy Spirit will never run out. His grace will never run out. It will always be enough. His mercies get renewed every single day. Stop looking for something else. He's here. He's with you. He's for you. He wants to get glory through your life. He wants you to produce fruit. That thing inside of you that doesn't want to produce fruit, whatever you call that, that's too insecure, that's too afraid, that's too something else, that's the work of the enemy. That's Satan seeking to steal, kill, and destroy. And it's robbing you of the life that God wants to give you. A life that has meaning, that has significance, that matters. Some days we just have to decide. Who am I? Who do I want to be? Who's God? And who do I want him to be in and through me? I want to fit in with the crowd. Okay. You're not going to fit in with Jesus and fit in with the crowd at the same time usually. I've been rejected by pastors. I've been in times where church people, it means people I knew. The only person you can depend on is Jesus. But he will give you every single thing you need for the moment you're walking through on any given day. That's what abiding means. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, if we could just learn to remain, to have this unbroken, continual fellowship through your Holy Spirit with Jesus, it changes everything. Conviction's different, encouragement's different. Everything we walk through is just different. It's this ongoing, it's not a backlog of stuff. There's no guilt trips. It's just this ongoing conversation of you giving us hope and you renewing us and you correcting us and you challenging us and, and you asking us for a step of obedience and you asking us to show patience or you working in us to give us peace or you giving us opportunities to be light and darkness. God, it's just ongoing 24 hours a day. It's, it's, we shouldn't be distracted. We shouldn't be uninspired. We shouldn't be bored. If we're following you, if the life source of Jesus is flowing through us, his own words, it's a river of living water that flows from within us and through us to make a difference in the world we live. God, I, I pray. God, I pray we, we change how we think and see your work in us. God, and may your spirit be that river that Jesus talked about that flows in us and through us into our communities and the culture we live in, into the region we live in. And God, we, 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 we lay ourselves down before you and say, use us to bring yourself glory in the place that we live. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.